Mastermind, and I'm excited today to take the reins. I'm Todd Bookspan, the founder of Win by Noon, and on behalf of Dave and the whole Trust Engine crew, welcome to another Friday Mastermind. I'm excited, as always, to have our co-host, CEO of Plug and Play SM, Deborah Bird. What's up? Happy St. Patty's Day, everybody. Who's getting lucky you know, today? And you know what? That sounded really bad. I don't mean it like that, but <laughs> you know, hopefully you're wearing green. You know, I um I should be wearing it, you know, I like a green shirt underneath my win by noon black today, but I am not. But uh, but super excited as always to be here with all of you on a Friday. Um, just a little housekeeping first on the Modern Mortgage, Modern Real Estate Summit. Thank you all who attended live or virtually. Um, this afternoon, um, mid-afternoon, we will have, um, to all of you who purchased virtual tickets, you will have your email from the WBN Training Vault, stands for Win by Noon, and it'll give you access uh, for a little over 30 days to the content. And then we'll also have the website back up, modernmortgagesummit.com, where if you didn't get it and you've heard how awesome it was, you'll be able to purchase access to it. So be on the lookout to your email. And then the other favor I have of you is if you attended, there's gonna be a survey in there. We would love your feedback on how we can, how we did and how we can make it better for next year. And that was a lot of fun, Deborah, hanging out with you in Vegas. It was a blast. I loved it. And you know, the implementation mastermind the day after that you led was just, I think anyone who was there in the room can say that was also such a highlight because you have all these, you know, elite players in one space sharing and being able to mastermind together and really put just ideas and good intentions into action. So, you know, thank you for hosting that. And I think we're going to do a live call next week on Thursday, right? For anyone who wasn't there live that they could join. Correct, Todd? We are, we are, I will, uh, once uh, we're off and running, I will pull the link from Zoom and I will post it in. So anyone who wants to um, jump on that with you and I, that's going to be uh, a lot of fun just to help folks who want to figure out really whether you attended the event or not. It's just a great opportunity to walk through um, the seven, eight steps of implementation, which is really important. I think people show up to an event like that, go home and just don't carve out the time. And so what I loved about the in-person mastermind was, you know, we had most of the speakers there and, uh, you know, 30 or so attendees. And it was just fun to have everyone in a room um, really uh, sharpening each other, right? Iron sharpens iron mm -hmm. and really looking at what they could do to be better as we headed out of the event. So it was, it was a personal highlight for me for sure. Yes. All right. So why don't we introduce our guest today? Let's, uh, let's stop talking about us and let's make it about him. Yeah. Okay. So Marty Preston is joining us today. And I just, you know, when I first saw Marty Preston on stage, for those of you who don't know, he is, he's a goat. He's a legend in our space. Um, ironically, I want to say it was in 2004, Marty actually traveled to Washington to become the first certified mortgage planner in Kentucky. So you're going to hear a little bit of an accent from him. Um, he's still in production in between his own personal production and all of his offices. They have served over 600 families, according to your website, Marty. So hopefully that's still accurate. But, um, you know, welcome. We're, we're, we're excited to have you and we can't wait to dive into the wow experience that you are creating for your partners. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. And uh, your sister texted me this morning and uh, and told me that that I was going to be talking to the world today. So I said, well, I mean, that, that might overstate the reach just a little bit, maybe by a couple. But uh, if the world if the world wants to to listen, hopefully hopefully it'll help. Like I said before, I'm going to tell you a whole bunch of stuff that that a, a bunch of people like Denise and Wally and Todd and Dave, I remember when I first started in the business, um, I had my, you know, my background as an accountant and uh, Dave was, Dave Savage was actually one of the first people that I was kind of drawn to because he was one of the first people that I heard about who worked with financial planners and CPAs mostly and not real estate agents. So it's a little bit ironic that the focus today is on real estate agents because when I got started in the business, I actually worked with very, very few agents and more did the financial planning side of it. So, uh, but it'll be fun. You get, you know, over time, I've been doing this long enough now since you used the word legend. I guess that legend, I think old now, that's that's kind of the, the synonym, I think, for that, but uh, happy to be here. 
Well, you know, you've made it through multiple shifts and you've been able to have repeatable results no matter the market. So I think there's wisdom there that could be shed on whether you're a brand new LO or maybe you're a branch manager who's also trying to reignite or, you know, inspire your loan officers when, you know, this market is a little different than usual, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I listened to uh, Shayla Gifford, uh, did an interview, I guess, a few months ago, and um, he's one of my favorites to uh, listen to. Number one, just because watching her, her energy is just like, I'm, I'm not nowhere near like that, but um, she was just talking about, you know, you went through 2008, which, you know, was a very tough year, but then you had a 12-year run. So you said, you know, this is different than normal. I mean, when you think about the last 12 years, this is certainly different. Um, I pulled out some notes from some talks that I gave in 2016, and then in, especially in 2018. I think we were just starting to get into what we're kind of seeing today. Um, and, and then, you know, it, it shifted again really quickly and then just went crazy. Uh, but we were just starting, you know, the, that mar margin compression term was being used a lot and all that stuff. Well, this time it, you know, it fully hit. So, you know, we're here, but her point was, you know, would you suffer or fight through a 2008 again and sign up for that? If you knew on the back side of that, there were going to be 12 years of, you know, crazy good production and all that. And of course, you know, the answer is yes. And I mean, as you'll, one of the concepts or one of the words that you all have used multiple times is mindset. And I heard Dave say that multiple times and I heard Shayla say it. And I think that's it. I mean, my mindset is I'm actually excited. Uh, 2021 and, and 2020 were great. Don't get me wrong. But uh, what we're going to talk to you about today is value. And it was kind of tough to bring value in those couple of years because, you know, any real estate agent you talk to, they had, they had all the business they wanted. Any loan officer you talked to, they had all the business they wanted. Um, you know, so it, it wasn't like there was really a whole lot of value that you felt like you could add. It was, you know, people were like, well, could you get my offers accepted? So we came up with some creative approval letters. I remember saying, you'll never get a, a commitment letter from a mortgage lender. And then, you know, all of a sudden <laughs> we're writing commitment letters. But, um, you know, outside of a few things like that, it's like, you know, and now it's the exact opposite. Now every real estate agent's like, you got, any, you got anything, you know, can you help me with this? Can you, you know, tell me what's going on? How can, and loan officers, same way. So uh, I'm excited about, um, you know, being able to come up with ways to uh, excel in a market where, I mean, frankly, most people aren't going to do very well. And, and that's okay, as long as, I mean, I, I was probably going to save this for later, but, you know, the baddest line in the jungle isn't worried if there's a drought because there's going to be enough for, for him or her. And, uh, you know, uh, some friends of mine, uh, the owners of Benchmark have a, a super ranch down in Texas that have all these unbelievable white-tailed deer that, you know, they breed and everything else down there. And, it's, you know, the, the biggest buck on the ranch isn't worried about how many does there are because there's going to be enough for, for him. So as long as you have the value and you can bring that value and share and show that value, there are more loans closing in your market than you can do. You know, I'm in Lexington, Kentucky. That's not a big market. Uh, last month, there were 380 real estate purchases in my market. Uh, so that's, a, you know, that's not a lot, but 380 is certainly more than my team's ever closed in a month. So as long as we get those, we're good. And, you know, I'm okay with only 50% market share. So that's where we are or where we're headed. All right. How awesome would it be that 50% market share? I just, uh, I just love that. And I think that, you know, the concept is there, right? I think the business, you're right. The business is there. We just have to figure out how to go get it. And I think more than ever, our real estate partners are counting on us, which is great. I mean, we always complain that they're not interested in us and now they really are. And uh, so I think that's that's the big takeaway for me so far is what do we need to do to get more market share? 
Yeah, and I, I don't know if they're counting on us because I, I don't think they expect a, a, a lender to be able to solve their problems. But I think if you have solutions for them, they're, they're certainly open to, to listening to anyone right now, you know? So um, if you have some solutions uh, and that's, you know, part, part of being in a community like this is you do have solutions because I mean, there are a few things I think I understand and know quite a bit about. There's a whole lot more that I don't understand and don't know very much about which is why I'm on there listening to Shayla's interview and Wally's interview and Dave, and you know, because I'm going to learn something from that that I can share with an agent or a loan officer or something or someone that will bring value to them. And, you know, that's, it's not what agents are looking for. That's what we're all looking for. I mean, that's in anything, whatever it is that you're dealing with or buying or whatever you want value, which is by definition, you're getting more than you're giving. So I think if you can bring that, you're gonna you're gonna have it. Hopefully I can show you a few ideas today that you can use to share some value. Yeah, I think that would be great. I think that probably what everyone is thinking now is, you know, so then how do we do that? If if there's more loans closing in my market than I can actually do, where do I start? And we have some that you know, is, does that mean cold calls? Does it, does it mean creating your prospect list? Is it, so walk us through kind of what, where would you advise kind of step one? Yeah, I mean, um, step one would be, in my opinion, your path of least resistance. So uh, that's going to be something different for, for everyone. So like I said, when I got started in the mortgage industry, I just graduated from college with an accounting degree. I've been working as an accountant for a brief period of time. I struggled going and getting real estate agents. That's what I was told I needed to do, but I didn't have any strategies or game plan for that. And I had lunch with a friend of mine who was working at a large accounting firm. And he literally said, man, I wish, I wish you could work with our clients because I, as a new accountant, I'm the one that spends all day on the phone talking to lenders, trying to explain to the lender that our client actually does make enough money to qualify for the loan but they don't understand depreciation as a non-cash expense and all these different things. He's like, if I could just work with, you know, if all my clients could just work with you, you know, that would solve a bunch of problems. And I was so clueless at the time. I didn't go, well, send them to me. I was like, yeah, no, I'm being told I need to go get real estate agents. So I, you know, and then maybe a month later, it literally hit me in the shower. Like, why couldn't I just go get business from Joe? So I went, met with Joe again, was like, send me business. And kind of that's how I got started is I kind of got known as the person that could help people who own their own business that had a little, you know, funky thing on their tax return, get those loans closed. And that kind of grew from there. And I actually met real estate agents from there, you know, because they were representing someone who couldn't get a deal done somewhere else. And then we did and, and, and some of that. So that's how it started. So the path of least resistance would be my, my starting point. Like wherever you have influence or know someone that has influence. And then from there, I would just go through kind of a, a, a little bit of a checklist, which is, you know, you do want to make sure that the person that you're meeting with, so let's take a real estate agent, for example, you know, I could spend the next month meeting with three real estate agents a day and on my report card or whatever I'm keeping track of for activity, that's gonna look really good. But the reality is everybody knows the 80-20 rule. Um, if your market's anything like my market, in real estate, it's more like the 95-5 rule. About 95% of the properties are sold by about 5% of the agents. Well, if I'm meeting with the wrong 5%, I'm just gonna spend a whole bunch of time with people that are never gonna sell a house anyway. So. You do want to make sure that those people are selling enough properties, or at least you think they're going to, because you don't want to exclude someone that's new that's going to absolutely be a killer in two, two years or maybe even two months. But you, you at least want to make sure they're moving enough properties to where it's worth your time to do it. So I would, you know, there's just a little checklist of path of least resistance. Is their sphere of influence great enough to where I can? Um, you know, expect 
a return on my time and, and investment. And then for me, uh, I know this sounds cliche because I know when I was new in the business, I thought, yeah, right, but please hear this. Um, you need to interview them and make sure it's somebody you want to work with. There's just nothing worse than working with someone that doesn't understand the way or appreciate or value the way you do business. So for me, the way I do that, if, if when I'm talking to them and I call it an interview, I don't, I don't tell them I'm interviewing them. So I want to be clear about that because sometimes we say stuff on stage and on these calls that I think make us sound cool. And it's like, no, nobody's going, yeah, I'm going to interview you. Um, so, and if they do, you probably sound a little bit arrogant if you did that. So I'm not meaning it like that, but in my mind, it is very much an interview. I'm just not presenting it that way. And what I ask them is, you know, what do you like best about real estate? And I'm looking for them to say, I really like helping people. I really care, um, you know, like I want somebody to tell me if, 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 if they did something wrong or a deal fell through or something like that, that it actually bothers them and they feel bad about it. You know, uh, I don't care if they're in it for the money. I mean, let's face it, I'm not going to do this if I don't get paid. Um, but you have to be someone that wants to help people to work with me because I find that people who want to help people uh, fit very well with the way we do business. So, um, there's three things that's usually all I can remember. So I'll stick with that for now. Well, and I think just what you said with aligning your values, there's nothing worse than when there's values conflict, the relationship is always going to struggle. So not only, you know, interviewing them to make sure that there's a, a value alignment, but then also to discover what do they perceive as valuable because there's nothing worse than, you know, kind of vomiting at the mouth and, and trying to help somebody, but maybe you're not actually helping them because for some, maybe it's a, a lead generation problem, but for others, it's not a lead generation. It's a lead conversion problem or a incubation and nurturing problem. So it's, it's always best to ask and to then button up and listen and find what's valuable to them. But I agree. I think uh, also aligning your values is essential. Yeah, and uh, so there's kind of two things here. Uh, your sister has me a little bit of a mindset shift on this because in my mind, there's two types of partners I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for one partner that I'm actually going to spend a lot of time with personally. That's somebody I'm going to, you know, maybe even do a face-to-face one-on-one quarterly partner planning session. And so that's like a real business partner. So like Jim Moore that we may get to later on, um, like I think the best year we had is we closed 41 transactions together. We helped, we served 41 families together. And at one point I was like over 80%, I think it was 88%, but 80, over 80% 80 of his buyer sides we closed. So when you're tracking conversion, that that's a phenomenal number. I've never heard anybody close to that, to be honest. Um, when we do metrics, 25% means they're a partner. 50% means that they're a very solid partner. And, and what I mean by that is if, well, the way I usually say it is if, if an agent's sending you 25% of their buyer sides, that means in their mind, they're sending you everyone because what they're really doing is sending you everyone that asks. They're not sending you anyone that's already pre-approved somewhere else, but they are sending you everyone that asks. At 50%, it truly means they're trying to send you everyone. And if you get above 75%, it means that they're almost like, you'll have, you'll have clients come in and be like, like, what did you, what do you have on that guy? Or what did you do to him? You know, because like, you know, um, like, you know, because he's very adamant. I had a, C, a CFO come in one time and he's like, I'm not using you because, you know, my company has like, millions of dollars at this other bank but I mean Jim pretty much just said like I have to meet you and that you would be okay with that but I don't want to waste your time so I'm just telling you I'm not using you but Jim wants me to you know so if, if you're above 75 percent then you've got a partner that's a hyper advocate is what I would say so that's and but then on top of that you've got 
if you're fishing with a net, as Denise says, then you know you can add value to a lot of people without having to even meet with them. Um, you know, you could, for example, you could take an interview like this, take parts of it, share it with agents and say, look, this is how lenders across the country help real estate agents. This is what, you know, I'd like to do with you and, and, and just take some of that information and share it. I don't think it even has to be you. Um, in fact, I think sometimes there's some value in, in it being someone else. You know, I, I personally, it, it, it bothers me a little bit when I see financial, everybody wants to give financial advice. And, you know, I've done okay financially, but I still feel a little bit funny if I'm like presenting myself as a financial expert, you know, and there's all kinds of financial experts out there. So it's almost like, why don't I just share that video instead of, you know, they know it's coming from me. So I think we make it too hard by, by thinking you've got to create all this content yourself sometimes and all that. I think I think if you're just sharing value, they're going to get something from it, and that that's the key. Like they don't care if it came out of your mouth. I don't. I don't think that's my opinion. So. No, I love that. It's all about reciprocity, right? If you're, yeah, I agree with you 100. You don't have to be uh, the smartest person in the room. You just have to present them with the smartest available knowledge that you have, and they will remember it. So that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you may um, need a translator for me. Uh, you know, so. Certain people can understand my uh, English, but uh, as long as they can understand what I'm saying, it'll be good. No, I agree. I think um, one of the things shared at the summit last week was, so Denise will do an expert series and she does a different expert series, whether it's for her database of clients who have already chosen her and she's trying to retain and maintain those relationships and deepen in them, not just the ones that are only interested or raising their hand and buying, which I think is important, but then she also does it for her partners. So last month I, I spoke and did a social media segment where she filled the room and I can just tell you, as soon as you said, you know, sometimes leave it to the experts to speak. I, I was going to put in the chat, preach, because there's nothing worse than even I'll witness loan officers try to be the social media expert. And I'm like, dude, you're, you're given info that was, that's like a year outdated. So, you know, it's okay to lean on others who actually do something as their full-time job. And that's their trade and practice and leverage their IP and still provide value where, I think that's where some get overwhelmed and they don't end up executing is because they think they have to be the knowledge source for all of it. And you don't, you know, leverage out other financial advisors or CPAs or divorce attorneys and let them come speak and provide value. Yeah. And I mean, I even think it's, it, it has more credibility that way because, you know, that person is an expert. So, you know, I could, for Denise, for example, I would have permission to do this, but you know, she has some great content. I, I'm going to be better off, honestly, just taking her content and sharing it as it is, as opposed to copying it and making it come from me, you know. So uh, a lot of people do that without her permission, but uh, because she provides such great content, I would never do that. But I'm just saying, like, there's all kinds of, you know, whether it, I, Todd and I were just talking before we got on the call, I have a, a friend who's a very high level consultant, and he was talking about the whole banking situation with the FDIC, and I was going to share that uh, with Todd, and, you know, if, if I took that and wrote it and sent it to him, I promise it's going to have less credibility to Todd than it would be coming from this expert that works with banks all the time that really understands what's going on. It just you know, you don't have to be, be the best at everything. And frankly, everyone knows you're not because no one is. So nothing wrong with just saying, hey, this person's really good at this. Here's what they say. So speaking of great presentations, you've prepared something for the crew here. Do you want to uh, jump in on that before we hit uh, yeah. the next 30 minutes? And we're having so much fun, but I'm like, all right, I know Marty's prepared something. I want to make sure that we uh, honor you and make sure that you have the opportunity to present that. Yeah, and so what I'll do is, um, so, you know, a long time ago, as we were talking about, I, I did a borrower presentation that, that kind of caught some traction and people like. So this is just a, a, a partner presentation. So one thing I do want to point out is, my, this is my own philosophy or style or whatever, but 
if I'm meeting with a real estate agent to become a partner, and again, I can share value and things with people that I'm not meeting with and I can get business from them. But, you know, if they're doing enough business to where I want to take it to another level and try to get to where I'm getting 50 to 75 percent of their buyer sides, obviously that's going to require, in my opinion, a little bit more personal interaction. The first meeting I do with them, uh, I'll do at a neutral site, restaurant, usually lunch, because I'm not a big morning person. And uh, I don't bring any presentation like this. So I want to be very clear. In fact, I make it a huge point to not sell anything at all in the appointment. And um, you may think that's a waste of time and, and for all, I don't know, maybe it is, but it drives them crazy. And my thought is, is it's kind of like the dating uh, analogy. It's like, you know, they expect a, a, a lender to come on pretty hard right at the beginning and, and you know, uh, you should use me because of this and this and this. And I've just seen it happen now over 20 years or more like 19 since I have kind of started learning this stuff is if I just kind of take that I trust interview approach and I'm just asking them questions and I'm, I'm intentionally not selling myself as the lunch goes forward. It, it's almost like they're like, okay, wait a sec. This is weird. You know, like, do you not like me or am I not pretty to you? Or, you know, like everybody else is just like throwing stuff at me from the beginning. And you, you haven't even asked if we want to do business together yet. And, I've had it happen where, you know, by the end of the lunch, they're almost asking to do business with, with us. And I've had, actually had it happen where they are. So um, it's just a mindset, you know, back to that word again, it's just a mindset difference. But, and then at the end of the lunch, if there's a value match, then what I'll say is, and this is just my script that I go through is I would say, hey, Deborah, you know, Here's what I think we could work well together. I think we could have fun. I think we could make a lot of money. And, and most importantly, I think we could make a difference. What do you think? And it might not be 100% of the time, but I can't remember when somebody didn't respond with, yeah, I think so too. And what's funny is I just told you, I have still not shown or said anything to them about what we do, how we do it. We haven't talked about customer service. We haven't talked about rates. We haven't talked about anything really except them. And I say, what do you think? And they go, yeah, that's what I think. And I go, okay, well, listen, here's what I'd like to do. I do believe that we do some things differently and that we excel in a few areas. And I would really like to show those to you. So I'd like to go ahead and schedule a time for you to come by my office and we can invest about 30 to 45 minutes so I can show you a few of the things that I think we can do different that may be able to have an impact on your business and your clients. And they go, that sounds great. We schedule the appointment, okay? This, and I assume, can everybody see what I'm showing you? Yep, there we go. This is what I show them. So not this part because this is more for you all, but what do agents want slash cut out need from their partners? So value. So there's three really big things that we talk about. One is how we're going to help their clients. And I think this gets lost a lot because um, we focus so much on value to agents that we forget the client does still drive the, the ship. And if you don't believe that, just ask an agent why they didn't refer you more business and they'll say, well, the client already had this, that, or the other. If, the, if you provide enough value to the client, then the agents will refer you more. So the, the next thing is they want some help. They want business planning or strategies or, or, or leads or whatever. And the number one thing they want is right here, money. Uh, now, you can't just give them money legally, of course, but it is cash. So you might be able to get by with that. But if you can refer them enough business. So, um, you know, Wally, a couple of months ago, and, and of course, Wally and Denise and I now all work together, which is unbelievable because now we have, you know, works out where what she's phenomenal at I suck at and Wally's phenomenal at certain things that I suck at and then I'm pretty good at the financial part of it and, and I can help them and it's been awesome but um, you know what everybody really really wants is how can you help them make more money and Wally said I think if I remember in his last interview 
that they referred out over $2 million in commission to real estate agents, financial planners, family will attorneys, and things like that in one year. Well, imagine just that. If you just went to a real estate agent and go, my team refers out to over $2 million of commission a year, uh, we're going to, at that point, you could say it's an interview. We're going to interview you to see if you're going to qualify to get some of our referrals. And people would be like, okay, that's a good deal. All right, so I'm going to go through this quick. You know, we send them a video because Denise is helping me. And, you know, you don't have to meet everybody and say the same thing a hundred times. You could actually record a video that shows what your client experience is. And then you could send it or just share it with agents or show it to agents. And then I could have 500 agents see what that is without having to meet with them. So you can have a video of the client experience. And let's see. Click through. Oh, this way. Um, obviously, reviews. Uh, I like this one because we highlighted some certain things. So we'll show that to the agents. He says, team is very informative upon current trends, risks, and opportunities. I'll ask the agent at that point, like, how many of your clients have that reference, you know, after talking to a lender? Like, you know, they had good closing costs, they had low rates, but, you know, how many of your clients say that the lender that they worked with has been very informative on current trends, risks, and opportunities in the market? Best methods to finance a home based on physical and, finance and family situation and enthusiastically help even if the result is no action great firm to work with. Uh, this one is my favorite of all time because the guy calls me a financial wizard. Uh, so that's a that's a fun one. And this is Jim Moore, the agent that we talked about. He just says that he wants his clients to have a great experience and all that. So we show that to the agents so they can see third party endorsements, okay? And then we wanna tell them some things we do like guarantee our rates and closing costs and guarantee approval letters and guarantee closings won't be delayed because if you're a real estate agent, you've probably had all those. We share with them all the other things that we can do. And the last one's my favorite, anything else that you would like to discuss, but you know, we'll help clients find out about how to save on their current debt or plan for retirement or children's education or tax strategies. There's over 20 types of insurance involved and you know we'll help them with all of it. And of course, we're gonna to talk to them about a total cost analysis, personal financial plan, stuff like that. And I think I can pull this in. So an easy one that we do is just quick total cost analysis where let me get this over. I think everybody can see both sides of that. There we go. Um, you've got one client's putting down 200,000, one putting down 100,000. There's an extra 100,000. And we're just showing them that if they invested that other $100,000, everything on the mortgage looks terrible. You know, I'm paying more per month. Everything looks bad until we look at the end of the term and if I'm only getting a 7% return on my investment, my net worth is over $800,000 more by not putting that extra $100,000 down on the mortgage. So we just show them stuff like that. This is a thing that I got off of uh, Ramsey Solutions. I'm a Ramsey Solutions, uh, it's not certified, designated master financial coach. So I have some access, but this one, this one still blows my mind. I show it to every client that, you know, Ben invests $2,000 a year for seven years and then never invests after that. His brother Arthur, Arthur picks up at 27 and invests all the way to 65. They're just using the average rate of return of the S&P 500. And Ben, who invested substantially less, still has... $700,000, $750,000 more in investments. So, you know, we just let them know that we're doing some personal financial strategy stuff. We customize it to them by asking them questions. Uh, we talk to them about rates. And before I segue into that, do you all have anything you want to ask or highlight or emphasize on any of that stuff? This is kind of a segue from personal finance into kind of rates and education and stuff like that. But it's still on the, you know, really all this is still what we do for their client. 
which then creates value for them. Yeah, you know, I just love it. So, I mean, you you walk them through, it sounds like a fairly choreographed process when a client comes to your office. So you're not just winging it every time they come in. No, it's very choreographed. You know, it's always customized to them because everybody has different, you know, assets, different income, different debt structure. So it's always just like every PCA you've ever done. It's it's always customized, but it, it is also at the same time very structured. And the way it all started is I would forget. You know, I would, I would have, I would, I would think I went through that part with that client. And then I would, you know, there would be something come up the week of closing that was a problem. And I'd be like, well, I guess I forgot to go over that. So it was more of a reminder, just like if I'm on stage giving a talk, the, the PowerPoint's oftentimes just a, a place setter so I can remember what to say next. And it, it kind of started that way uh, because there were important things that we didn't want to leave out. And, um, you know, now if we're not meeting a client face to face, we're doing it over Zoom or whatever. And instead of showing them a PowerPoint presentation, what that's enabled is me to actually just pull up third party sites, which actually provides even more credibility. Because, you know, if I'm just pulling up a site that you can pull up on your own, I stole this from Denise too, like uh, the um, loan level pricing adjustments, like I can put in here, like you'll see in a slide in a second, what the loan level pricing adjustments are. but if you're a skeptical person, you're going to kind of wonder about that. Whereas if I just show you that I just pulled up Fannie Mae's website and show you how to do it and you can read it for yourself, you can't be skeptical about loan level pricing adjustments anymore. So that even allows us to, to kind of, so now instead of just showing them a PowerPoint like we used to, we'll actually pull up third party sites and, and show them stuff, whether we're in the office or on a Zoom call. But it's definitely choreographed. And, and what's the time frame of that? Is it a 30 minute hour? What's that look like on average? It's one of those two. It's 30 minutes and it's always kind of depending on the client and what they get into. So um, that the slide I showed you a minute ago, more than a mortgage, we used to try to hit them with all that at once. And uh, the two reasons we stopped. Number one is it took too much time. Uh, but more importantly, you can't hit everyone with everything at once. Uh, you know, they're already buying a house. That is stressful enough. I've bought several. And the truth is, even when I buy a home, there is a part of me during somewhere in the process where I go, did I do the right thing here? And I kind of have to remind myself that I've already kind of done the due diligence. But, you know, everybody is a little stressed over that. So if I hit you with you need life insurance and a will and a mortgage and everything. And I hit you with all that day one, you know, a lot of people, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people are going to freak out. So we, we kind of shortened it because, and then at the same time, that also provides value on our post-closing and our, you know, client care process, which is mortgage reviews and things like that. Because now we, one thing people ask me all the time is, you know, when you call a client after closing, what do you talk to them about? Well, anything, you know, you can talk to them about what, whatever their needs are. So just ask them, you know, if you ask a client about college education planning and they don't have kids, they'll, they'll tell you they don't care, you know, so that gets pushed off for later. And, what and I think it's great too clients... that you, oh, go ahead. No, okay, real quick, and then I'll let you go. What percent of your clients is Zoom now versus live? Um, you know, I'm still about 75% live, uh, I'm back to 75% live. Um, I used to be really strong on this. So like if you met me at a seminar and told me that, you know, your clients wouldn't come in, I would usually have a comment like, you know, Kentucky's football team's not very good, but they still have 75,000 people show up every week for a mediocre football team, you know? they'll show up if they understand that it's valuable enough. And I believe that, but I've also been in Dallas a lot more lately and I've also driven around Dallas a lot more lately. And I mean, you know, it does take a pretty strong commitment if I have to drive two hours to get to your office. And, and I, can, I can understand that. Can I justify it? Sure. I mean, you know, you're gonna buy a house every five, six, seven years or need a mortgage every five, six, seven years. It is probably the the largest financial decision you'll make in your life. You can probably justify, you know, taking however many hours it takes round trip to do that. But 
we could also do it over Zoom and, and I could make a pretty strong argument that I provided more customer service and value by doing it that way. So, um, and it takes less time. So it could be a win-win. And I like that if it could be recorded, just thinking of the generational shift and the number of millennials and Gen Z's who are most likely going to be a lot of the buyers in the next couple of years, they will rewatch it, slow it down, maybe get validation from parents. It's really hard for them to remember. I think they say after two weeks, you only remember about 2% of what you've been told or shown, but when you can rewatch it and make it interactive, there's a higher retention rate. So I, I like when it's zoom and you can, you know, do that as well. But I do agree. I think sometimes the live allows you to just read energy in the room a little bit better. You know, sometimes when you're on Zoom and the internet's not good, it's like, uh, 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 you know, it can sound weird. So there's there's some people who want to come in and then there's some that that would create friction. And if they have to schedule a time, well, then they may never book. And so then you miss an opportunity because there's someone else that will have more digital process and less friction. And, you know, someone will go that route. So yeah. Benefits to you both. just gave me an idea I had to write down because I mean what you just said is a great idea because a lot of times you do deal with that where you know they're getting in influence from someone else and that's one one of every lender's frustration is is it's like you know I've got them sold but all of a sudden dad isn't you know and the fact that they can record that and just show that to dad I'd much even their own spouse that happens a lot you know you'll you'll end up doing kind of the appointment twice sometimes because one spouse or partner wasn't there. And then, you know, they didn't do a good job explaining it to them. So then they asked you to explain it to their spouse or partner. So then you get to do it twice. So just being able to record it creates value and saves time for, for you and for them. So yeah, that's a great idea. Something I'm going to start suggesting and 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 making sure that they know that that's a, a good thing to do. So that was that was worth me being that on. That was my uh, my my that was my cheat whenever I taught middle school science. I used to record all of my lessons. And I would tell kids, before you come into tutorials, this was just the lazy teacher approach. I would say, I've recorded all the lessons. They're on YouTube. Go watch them. Put your earbuds in. Hit pause. Rewrite your notes. And that was my way of just avoiding having to repeat myself a million times for the same thing over and over. So can we get science lessons with Deb on YouTube still today? You can. In fact, I'm, I'm actually going to drop the video that I recorded for today's coaching lesson. So every Friday I send out a little coaching nugget and it was inspired by Denise's talk from the summit where I went a little bit deeper on the generational shift. And it's very interesting to see just their lack of tolerance. If you don't have that digital process that they could go and watch like their brand loyalty, they don't really have brand loyalty. If if a website is slow to load or, you know, you don't have an easy app for them to upload documents, they get really frustrated because they were just, they were born kind of immersed into this high tech world, but little disclaimer, they do also want customization and personalization. I think because they have been so immersed in this ad centric high tech world that they don't want to feel like they're on a conveyor belt. So there is some auditing that everyone needs to do with their process or marketing where people don't, they don't want it to feel canned. So if you're doing those voice drops and standard text messages that don't feel genuine, that's also a problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I should say this too, you know, our, our fearless leader, Dave Savage is actually logged in he's he's flying on a plane and he's logged in through starlink and uh he was going to show a smiling face at the start but i was laughing thinking about dave on the plane talking really loud on zoom uh with all the other folks wondering what the heck he was doing but uh, he just posted a poll it's at the top of our trust engine productivity mastermind group on what content you would all find valuable right now so don't multitask and do it now we want to have marty finish up what he's talking about but if you can make sure by the end of the day you jump in there and uh, contribute to that poll that would be greatly appreciated awesome all right i'm going to show you one quick thing and i'm happy to give you the slides for that matter so uh, that would be awesome i was taking some pictures but i missed a couple of them and i have a full page of notes already all right, so this to me is like the, uh, this is the, the main point. So in getting in a, remember the number one thing everybody wants is money. And so 
what we ask the agents is if I could refer you one client for every client that you referred me, what would your business do in the next 12 months? How would your business grow? Most agents, not all, but most agents will quickly do the math and go one to one would be two, it would double. And that's the answer that I hope that they give. If not, I'll probably give them a little help and try to get them to kind of say that. But I want them to verbalize it like, well, if I referred you everyone and you referred someone back to me for every person, then my business would double. And then I will quickly point out that that's accurate as long as they refer me everyone. Because there are two big differences. One is getting an agent to send you business. But one of the things that we track very well is conversion from referral partners. And out of, oh, 30 some loan officers that, that I help in one way or the other, most of them have the max number of referrals that they've received from a real estate partner year to date is two, three, or four, okay? That's not closings, that's total referrals. But they've got a lot of realtors who send them two, three, or four, and they've got a whole lot more that sent them one. Okay, which in my opinion is a very inefficient, uh, stressful, pain in the butt process because you don't have a process because you've got a whole bunch of business coming in a whole bunch of different ways. Okay, Denise is phenomenal at being able to educate her agents on how to send her business. In fact, almost every email I think that goes out to an agent at the bottom has a instructional video and text that says here's how to refer us even if the video or even if the actual email is about something else but most of us aren't thinking that far ahead so then we just kind of react to the agents and we don't we don't have a process but then i share this stat with them 88 percent of homeowners say they would use their real estate agent again but only 17 percent do one of the major reasons they don't even know the person's name so that gives us an opportunity to help them and just like you all are thinking right now, when I said, if I could refer you one deal for everyone you referred us, you know, what would that do? You're thinking, yeah, but how in the world can you do that? Okay. And here's how. Well, so there's this thing called Net Promoter Score, which Harvard Business Review thinks is pretty cool. And it says that, you know, the median total shareholder return for businesses that had a high net promoter score was five times the, the average. And so this is a question and this is net promoter score. So every time we close a loan, we say, how likely are you to use us again? Now remember, I just showed them our client experience, at least parts of it, not all of it obviously, but I showed them enough to where they got an idea. They're at my office and you saw the building earlier, we have reserved parking signs. So we're kind of giving them the client experience while they're there, they, they got the reserve parking signs. Usually they're taking pic pictures of it and posting it on social media after the meeting and, and stuff like that, which, which helps. But we're showing them what the clients are actually saying after the experience. So it's not us, it's what the client's saying. How likely are you to use this again or refers to all your friends, all circles, all of your friends, family and colleagues, or family, friends and colleagues. So, a nine and a 10 on that promoter score means that person's a promoter. If they're a seven or an eight, they're passive. And if they're a six or lower, then they're negative, okay? So to calculate your net promoter score, you take the percentage of people that gave you a nine or a 10, you forget about the ones that gave you a seven or eight, you subtract the ones, the zero through sixes, and that's your net promoter score. So, Net promoter scores of top five performing brands, Tesla, Starbucks, Airbnb, Netflix. Ours is two points higher than all of them, okay? So that gives us a pretty good chance to let people understand that we're in a position to actually be able to refer you business. Now, did I prove it? No. Good news is they want to believe it, I promise. Like they would love to believe that a lender out there somewhere could refer them business. I can tell them about my friend and, and partner in, in Dallas that referred out over $2 million of commission, you know, and I can show them this and, you know, 
if you're not doing it, that's okay. I wasn't either. You can show them that it happens and it's possible and you're going to start doing it and they would very much love to believe that you're going to get there. If they only think you can get halfway there, they're going to be fine, okay? And if you're following through and helping them on stuff, then they're going to be fine anyway because there are other ways to add value. If you just do a great job for their client, that's valuable. If you're helping them make money, it's way more valuable. And then if you're helping them with other situations that come up in their business, there's a company out there right now that if I understand the, their strategy correctly, and I think they just got about a billion dollar investment from Goldman Sachs, but I think their strategy is, is uh, you, you form a separate company with them. You're still with your own brokerage, but 50% of your gross revenue goes over here. And then they use that money and the scale that they've created and the systems that they've created to help you run your business more efficiently. And there are people participating at a high enough level to get Goldman Sachs to invest a billion dollars in it, I think. So that's a pretty good sign. And there's a lot of these things that we can help our partners with, and it would not cost them anything other than having them refer us business. So we, we have what we call an ambassador program, which is just this book. And it's simply a workbook that we compiled of all the tools that help agents or help businesses, loan officers. So there's business planning, time management, uh, team building, interview tools, things like that, that all of us have shared with one another over the years. And what the reason it was created is loan officers would say, yeah, but what, what do I do to help them? Well, you ask them questions to identify where they need help, which by the way, is also called a business plan. You read what their answers are, which is the business plan. You prioritize it, which is the business plan. And then you provide them with tools or resources to do it. It doesn't have to be you. Again, it's probably better if it isn't. But if I can connect people with Denise, and I can connect people with Wally, and I can connect people with top real estate agents that they know, and I can connect people to all kinds of different people here. It's going to be valuable, even if I don't know anything. And in addition to that, we've got a pretty awesome team here, and real estate agents don't necessarily have that resource. And right now, most people have capacity. So what if your team could help their team be more efficient. And now you've tied all three things together. You've helped their clients, you've helped them make money, and you've helped them with their business. And that is the whole presentation. That was awesome. Like truly awesome. I mean, I, I think that a lot of people watching this, their heads are kind of spinning, but you know, you said a lot of things, right? You're all about collaboration. You said, this is what I've put together over time from, you know, from being around. And so I always want to point that out, right? That's one of the beauties of this community is that we do have uh, great contributors like you, Marty, who come in there and collaborate. So remember that if those of you who watch the Modern Mortgage Summit, Shayla kicked it off and said, R and D rip off and duplicate, right? We're all, we're all pretty good at that. And um, it's what I love about the about the industry. So I appreciate you sharing that because I think there's gonna be lots of people who are either watching this live or watching the recording who are gonna figure out how to uh, duplicate what you've presented here with their with their clients and partners. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And you said earlier, welcome, welcome back to the community. I, I've been watching. I just figured like like me, I would much rather see Denise and Shayla and people like that on there as me. So I was like, well, they Wally too. So you you will I was like, I'll, I'll fill in this week and then you can get back to the A team. <laughs> no, you're, you're the A plus team, my friend. Well, well Denise thanks. gives a lot of her credit to you, Marty, because I know you've been her business coach for the last year as well. And, you know, I just want everyone to also realize that there was a lot of detail, like every, what is that saying? Every stone left unturned or however that no saying stone left unturned. goes. You, there, there you go. You can tell when you're that thorough up front. It's almost like when your clients fill out a very thorough 1003. It just makes the process much easier where you don't have to then try to remember, oh, did I 
did I tell them this? Because this is where it backfires. or this is where we're getting emails in our inbox because clearly this expectation either wasn't set from the get-go or we weren't thorough enough to educate on this piece. So it's almost, you know, planning with the end in mind, which creates that Chick-fil-A process where you don't have those bumps. And at the end of the day, that's what your agents and clients want. Like everyone wants a home, nobody wants a mortgage. And for some reason we've made the mortgage process so clunky and complicated and almost also not realizing it's an emotional process. And so, yes, they want the home, but they want to know they can afford the home. I mean, if you have four kids, I know Marty has four kids. I have four kids. It's like, can we, with the cost of inflation and groceries and college and sports, if I make this decision, there's that fear of, can I afford it? And then what if I can't? And so how are you helping your clients, not only during the process, but I think what's even more valuable and where most of the heavy lifting starts is the day after closing, because now you're helping them manage the largest debt that you help them create, where most can't even fathom like a car note, let alone a mortgage for 30 years. So I think this yeah. was excellent. Thank you, Marty. You, you just hit a huge point. That's more on the borrower side of it, but but if you do nothing more than add one step to your client presentation, which is help your client see, show them. That's why I put show me. We, we just, we have a new office in Kansas City and that's Missouri, Kansas and Missouri, but I think Missouri is known as the show me state. But if you show them that they can afford the house, because they don't know, they don't know anything about debt to income. I can say your debt to income is 80, that's good. And they'd be like, okay, good. But if you show them in their budget that they can afford the house and that it's not gonna change their lifestyle, the phrase I hear a lot is I don't wanna be house rich and cash poor. It just means, can I go on vacation? Can I eat out? Can I eat out at a nice restaurant? You know, like that, it just means really, am I, am I gonna regret this down the road? And if you can show them that they're not or how they're not, and, and, and structure loan in a way to where they're not, then uh, that alone will make a huge difference. So I had a conversation, somebody asked like, what percentage of your business right now should be client-based? And I think the answer I, I, I saw was, well, in a market like this, it's about 15, 15%. And uh, mine's 65%. That is uh, awesome. Now. So that why, is awesome. So why is that? You know, it's like, well, I think it's because the process we take the clients through, my, my hope, my goal is that the process we take the client through compels them to share the story. Just like we've all been compelled to share our experience over something, my hope is that that process compels them to if we did that, then we did everything we could do. And in fact, that goes back to the partner. That's the number one value I can provide for the partner is to create an experience where their client feels compelled to share the experience. So that's it. Well, I just, uh, I just love that whole idea of show me. So of course, I would be remiss if I didn't remind everyone that one of the tools that Marty is using is the good old TCA, the, the tool that this community um, was built around. So I want to make sure with Dave's absence that I don't forget that, but uh, yeah. certainly on behalf of the whole community, um, this was a lot of fun. I can't believe that the hour has flown by. And so Marty Preston, it's awesome to have you here. And uh, I love the fact that you say you've been lurking, watching everyone, but uh, I have no doubt we will have you uh, here more often going forward. So on behalf of Dave, Deborah, and the whole crew at Trust Engine, thank you for being part of the community and adding so much value. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks for creating all the right. tool. Amazing. Heck yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place.